Thank you, everybody. Just bear with me for a moment um, as I just share a short song, and I'll briefly explain a few things there after. Yeah, ceremonies of our season. Um, they're in the Sundance on the Southern Ute Reservation, which means that they are going without food and water for three days. They are um, intensely into a way of prayer and dance, and these are really moments of when we're really um, experiencing our reconnection and connectedness to everything that's natural. Um, in our world, everything is travels in a circle and everything is connected. Nothing is, is separated and nothing can be separated. Just as we heard Mary talk about how the, the plants and the ecosystem is outside, how one insect could be very important to the existence and, and um, continued uh, movement forward for that plant. That's how we are. And the one thing that I really like for people to understand is that as an indigenous woman, as a Ute woman, stepping back and understanding that you cannot separate me from any part of the discussion. And it's something that in today's world and Western society and forms of government, we're really great at learning how to silo and separate the most important things in our lives how we can focus and only focus on water issues, how we can focus and only focus on land issues. We can focus and only focus on health issues. We silo them and we don't talk about them without recognizing that in a more natural form of our indigenous existence has always been acknowledging our position in the bigger picture. I need water. I need land, I need plants, I need insects, I need the animals. There's no way that I could do without one of them. There's no way you all could do without any one of those as well. So it's really important to acknowledge the ceremony that's happening right now because there are people who are giving the opportunity to go without that water. And why are they doing that? The other thing that Western society has separated from everything we do, and that's taken a moment of sharing gratitude and saying thanks. Thanks for the water that's in my life. Thanks for the water that nourishes my body and allows me to think and allows me to feel and exist and be a part of this world. They are praying for all that we have, good or bad, because one cannot exist without the other. And that's all built into relationships. We talk about traditional land stewardship. I'm talking about my life. I am not talking about just plant life or access to water. I'm talking about my life. I'm talking about your life. So one cannot exist without the other. 
I like to remind people that growing up as the daughter, granddaughter, and great-granddaughter of some very important people in my life, that I had to live a life that you had to be thankful for all the little things that you have and understand by harvesting at the right time for the right reason, the right way is important. Not taking those shortcuts. Because in life, we're really good at figuring out how to take shortcuts. In the end, sometimes that doesn't always serve our purposes. And we don't learn the lessons that we should have. And somewhere along the way, and I learned this when I, when I first started college in psychology, if you miss a step in development, somewhere you're gonna have to go back and re-experience that. And that's something that our elders teach us. You do it right the first time, you won't hear that story again. <laughs> so, you know, you think about things and how they interrelate and how they're similar in manner and how we learn and how we how we live our lives. So I think it is a very special day today because I have people who are in prayer and ceremony, not for just themselves, but for all of us. And I went and spent the day with um, my family at the, the location of where the ceremony is. And I also prayed and, and helped to gain that acceptance and to be able to share with others that I'm going to be on the road tomorrow so that I can come to a place that I can share with others about our lives and how we utilize different things for different reasons. And so I was able to, to say that in prayer, to say that in song and in action. I also understand that this is through this ceremony, these things are very important. This is a willow, a young willow. How we use it is similar to how Mary explained about the cattail, how it can be used to weave a mat that can keep a person cool. Well, when does a person need to be kept cool? In the summertime? maybe during the ceremony that they're not allowed to touch cool water. And that's why these plants are very important. This willow and how you pick it, you pick it early in the morning on a Sunday like today. Had I been home, I would have been up pretty early out harvesting willows for dancers that I'm going to take it to. They take this willow and you can see right now, he's probably He's reacting to some of my body heat right now because he's drooping. And so we take these willows, we harvest them, and we take them to our dancers. And they utilize this by putting it, and this is going to sound familiar to all you, behind their necks, <laughs> maybe under their armpits, in places that we might know as pressure points, but also can be cooling points. We utilize willow, cattails, as well as um, mints, because the mint is, is, is an emollient, and if you rub that together, or even if you rub it on your skin in these certain places, it can help bring the, your body temperature down. Many of us will use some of the mints on our feet when our feet are hot, because we're gonna be out there with no shoes, no socks, just foot to my mother earth. So on a good warm day, some of those temperatures on the ground can be pretty extreme. And so we would use those, the mint emollients to help cool the body. That helps us get through that stressful moment of knowing that you're going without. Sometimes those moments can become pretty extreme and they can begin to affect how you see the world. And a 
lot of times those are those moments that um, some say you are closest to a spirit and closest to the creator. Your body is open to that. Why do we, and how do we get there? These guys help us. We don't see them as plants. We see them as a member of our family. Just as we see the land, the water, everything has a sense of being. When we take and harvest these, we say a prayer. But we also have, and always have, had our own unwritten management plans for these plants that grow up there. You never take more than you need. You always keep in mind that someone or something is going to come behind you. And so if there had been a large area of willows and I had several dancers that were dancing, I would take some here and find another location down the road and take a little there. While I'm doing that, I'm going to share gratitude and say a prayer and say thank you. May you grow in an abundance next year or into your future. We talk to them like they are members of our family and create the relationship and an understanding. We exist together in the same place and same space, which is very important to understand because this is a physical being to us. Isn't ethnobotany, isn't science, it's life. Because this plant started from something so small, a little piece of energy. Now, how many of us understand that we are just one big ball of energy? So is everything else that exists in our lives. And this is why I say so many times we forget that we're part of the system, but we get really great at siloing and separating ourselves from the bigger. When in all actuality, we are probably the biggest enemy, but yet we are the greatest gift because we can solve some of those, those challenging situations. We can implement restoration projects. We can continue to carry the message of not to over harvest, but to share gratitude. Move to different locations. Learn to let land and places rest. But even more so, something that many of us are raised with as children, you don't always have to question everything and not get an answer. You have to just create that understanding and relationship and know what is right is right. Because if your inner self says and feels like this is the right thing to do, then it probably is the right thing to do. But I can tell you one thing, science will always challenge you because they have an evidence-based way of helping us determine what is the best decision in so many aspects. Which is why it makes it a very special, a special time and a special way for me to share and acknowledge that nothing that I say or do can be physically proven or I can cite it in MLA status or um, virtues and, and have a paper published, is that gonna make you value that or understand that any more than if I were just an indigenous woman standing before you today sharing my indigenous knowledge with you on a special day of prayer, shared information, and sharing space. I love it that we can take these moments like this and create a time and a space 
that I can share and bring both science, Western knowledge, and bring it with my traditional knowledge, traditional ecological ways of our values, and allow people to experience like what you all have experienced today. And I bet it's not raining outside, but you know, I think in the bigger scheme of it all, understanding what we don't control and just having that capacity to accept it, but move forward. Um, I know Mary walked past one of the most important things in youth culture, That's, and I just picked a very small piece off, but it's um, off of one of the juniper trees, the little limbs and stuff, and sometimes also known as some cedar, um, and we burn this in all of our ceremonies. But we boil this as tea to help our body, whether it's to cleanse it or to help um, relieve an ailment. And then there's the little blue berries and how you tell the difference between a female tree and a male tree and the tendencies of it. Some of them have kind of a smoother little um, green on it, but then there's others that have a thorny green on it. And we refer to those in our way as, as mean. Those are the ones that you want to burn when you feel like you're really being challenged and you just need to help something, kind of help lead you through it. And they tell us, burn the thorny one. Get you past that. Burn the thorny one. It'll help find your way through whatever is challenging you. But for the most part, you can burn any part of this after you let it dry. And so if I were out harvesting, I might cut a limb off and I might just hang it for a week or two to let it dry. Um, and then when it's dry, you can easily just take like a paper sack or something and just put your hand over it and it kind of, you'll hear like a little crunching sound from it. And then it, the, the part that you harvest will all just fall into a pile and then you pull the limb off of it. And then we hold on to that and that's where you see some people carry little bags, little medicine bags. Some families have a bag that might have a little bit more, and that's where they'll keep their cedar. When our children or a family member may be bothered by a bad dream, or they're just not feeling well, or you've lost a family member fairly recently and everybody's kind of emotions are all over the place, one may burn cedar and say a prayer for the family help us find our way through that challenging moment. Um, burning or boiling water and letting the, the cedar and even um, recently my father shared with me of what his grandma would do with the, the little berries off of those trees. You'd clean them and dry them and then grind it into a powder and mix it into the tea. And I said Wow, I said we, we just make tea from everything, um, which was you know it's it's pretty it's pretty cool for me because I I've had this thing about tea, so I I love to go into tea shops and have all different types of tea, and I'm like, what does this one do? What does this one do? And so to find out, you know, that my people did the same thing. We had made tea from so many different things to help us work our way through some of our challenges, our physical ailments within our bodies, and even some of that that lived right here to help bring it to a point that we could deal with life. I always used to wonder why, and I'd get in trouble all the time about, how does grandma get through this? How did she do that? Why did she never raise her voice? Why did she just not respond to many, many of the things the way we do with, with extreme emotion and response? And she was always calm as ever and responded in a very eloquent way. And I was like, how does one get to that point? And I just figured, well, with age, you know, I guess you just learn how to deal with, cope with things. And then as I, part of it, part of that is true, but part of that is 
learning about how to use <coughs> what is in your environment to help you be the most healthy, calm person that you can be. And I said, so that's why my grandma used to tell me, respond with grace, even in situations when it isn't deserved. Take a deep breath and smile and wave. I used to think, that's hard. That's easier said than done. How do you do that? And as I've come through life and I've learned about things and seen how we utilize the different plants and how we managed, how grandma managed to be so dang calm, you know, it's, it's really about being aware of what your environment is. And I've always said this many times, you people, we are, we winter low and summer high. And who goes before camps are actually established in certain areas? It's the women, it's the grandmas, because they're looking around to see what resources are in abundance, to make sure there is a clear waterway, to look at how the game is moving out on the land, what time of the year and where are you? And so that's how camps were set, was according to, and being aware of what's in your environment that you may need for that season. Um, we've seen what we call the buffalo berry bush. Those are important because some of these plants, when they produce our fruit, it depends on how much they fruit or how little they fruit, but they can be an environmental indicator. They can tell you whether you are going to have a cold, a snowy winter or not. So we're very aware of how these plants have behaved and what they demonstrate through their abundance or a lack of. So we watch this. This is the knowledge that the grandmothers pass down to the, to the young ladies, to the mothers, and to others, other females. Some of this information is information that is very specific to the females and will be, comp will be handed down from generation to generation. So this is what a lot of the women of our people are. We are the ones who house the knowledge. Hence, we have the responsibility and accountability to be prepared to hand that knowledge off and to teach our young women and the other young women of our people about this. The challenge about that today is a lot of our traditional culture, custom, and even language is all oral. We don't have a lot of it written. We're trying. We're trying to use technology in the best way that we can. But part of that challenge also is it doesn't always look and feel culturally accepted by the elders. And so that's part of the challenge. Um, and it's, you know, it just doesn't look and feel like how it was done in the old days or the old ways. And so, you know, we're, we're trying to make those headways. We're trying to ensure that our, our language and culture and significant ties to our environment and land and resources are still in power. So, you know, there's there's so many things that not only is there restoration projects for um, some of the plant and, and animal habitats, but there's a restoration, huge restoration project in light of our language and culture. So hopefully we move forward that we have We'll establish more youth speakers. We'll also have more young people engaging in some of the programs that, for some reason, we think that creating programs is gonna help us restore our culture. It, it's my personal opinion that really it has to begin with town. Because where do we all spend the majority of our time besides work? It's usually with them. Whether we're traveling, whether we're at home, wherever that may be, that is really the, the fundamental process that probably would be acceptable by elders is if it went back to that family.
family structure and really, you know, just like a plant, where do you plant those seeds at? And where does the nurturing process come from? Usually from the family. So, you know, I just, I wanted to share some of this because this is what's important right now. And some of the stuff that we use when we're not feeling so great, um, but also understanding what is necessary for all of us to exist, water. So with that being said, I am gonna call Mary up and if you all have any questions, Mary and I can answer any questions. Do, do females participate in the sun dance also? You women don't. Um, but um, other tribes, um, other kind of sister tribes like the Shoshone, um, the Crow, and a few other tribes, they do. Um, I, my mother is part um, Union and tribe of Utah, but she's also Shoshone. Um, and when I was maybe about 21, I think. Um, yes, yeah, just you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I was I was called to participate, so um, that was one of the biggest challenges of my life was understanding who I am. You know, I I acknowledge I'm part Shoshone, and I didn't question. Well, I did question, and it took me a while to bring it forth. But you know, at the end of the day, it really came down to how do I feel? What do I feel is important? And am I willing to take that commitment on, not only as a youth woman, but even more so as a Shoshone woman? So I do, and I do participate in, in those song dances. Thank you for asking that question. Does anybody else have a question or comment? I'm sure your tribe is aware of climate change. Um, do the plants tell them what will be next year, or is it mostly telling you what has happened in the past? It tells us what's next year. Like if we start to see an abundance of a certain plant um, that might derive of more of a drier climate, they, um, they grow and behave in different ways. Um, sagebrush is, is another indicator of that um, where we see some changes in um, maybe the water table where we're not seeing a wet, um, kind of like a wetland area that acts as a sponge and it's the water's going away. You're gonna see more sagebrush grow in those areas. So really watching how some of those plants behave, it kind of tells us of what's going on. Um, I know that we're, actively engaged in um, working with a few agencies to see if we can help mitigate some of that by maybe trying to recharge some of those water tables and creating some um, mechanisms that would help to um, rather than seeing the water create a stream and cut into there that we can see it um, flow out evenly and maybe create more of that original natural marshy area or meadows um, so those are some things but that sagebrush can tell you a lot we noticed that just in our casual hiking too I, I think i told some of you that I, I keep a list every time i go out i i know what the weather is i know where i am what the elevation is what plants i see and the abundance of the plants and right now we've had some great moisture the last few weeks down in ridgeway where i live but if you go into the high country, it seems like you're, we're three weeks ahead of usual, which tells me that the plants may know that the moisture is not going to come later. So we're taking advantage of the, the time now. And then we start to see them, I say we like to see them, or we're, we start to see them act a little differently. And then at the higher elevations, they're going to start to feel a little bit of a change so we may we may if we start to see yellow early we're gonna have an early an early fall to what magnitude our winter may be yellow in the tree leaves yep and, and i'm gonna say this we're starting to see yellow. yes we are <laughs> on the way here i noticed that any other questions
Does Audrey have one? Yeah, I have one if no one else. But I'm curious just going off of um, what was said about climate change um, and how either of you think that maybe um, native plants and um, native or land stewardship could kind of go in with our food systems and kind of preparing and adapting for the future. I'm just going to say it's not even just climate change. You know, the whole pandemic experience. One of the scariest things that I experienced was going into the grocery store one day and seeing the shelves abundantly stocked, and then going in maybe a day or two later, and there was nothing on those shelves. But that indicated to me, <laughs> what would we do? Where do we go? And who are we? You know, it, it helped me to really step back and think about, I'm a you woman, what would we do if we didn't have a grocery store? Where is my grocery store? So it really made me think more in terms of a natural way of existing. Um, some of us may have partners that still hunt, but that's not entirely true of everybody anymore. Um, some of us may have the knowledge of the land that it still can provide for us in terms of sustenance. But not everybody has that either. But that was the real. Um, and as we move along and we see climate change and the challenges that it's providing for us, would we even know where to go look at or start to look? And so, you know, that really kind of opened my eyes and, and understand that moments like this are not only important to the indigenous people, but I think they're important to everybody. Yes. Kind of going on the, that same vein, what other opportunities is there to share knowledge like this between people that might be doing like permaculture or different types of ways of growing or paying attention to the landscape? Sharing space. Like I said, I think one of the things that has struck me in all the work that I've done is We've done a real good job of just letting everybody have their own conversations in their corners. And I think if we're gonna get through moments like this with these challenges, we have to learn to talk to one another. We have to learn to share space in presentation. Right, Mary? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, th I do think it's really important that every organization reach out to other organizations to share information I mean, the whole relationships between pollinators and specific plants is one of my um, buttons. But I often think about what happens when um, the climate warms up so much that in the alpine, the pikas have nothing to eat. They will die because they only live in the alpine. So there's there are so many interconnected um, relationships between the animals and the plants um, and the insects and um, the people that we really need to start paying attention to. I think we need to learn from the plants, the animals, and the insects. If we watch them and mimic some of their behaviors, which is a great thing to be reminded of, is that the reason that a lot of different uh, indigenous groups have their celebrations and ceremonies is based on and connected to the behavior of the animals and the plants and the seasons. They sing those prayers and mimic those movements of those animals, insects and whatnot, and they sing those songs, and a lot of those are mimicking the sounds of those natural existence that, that, that are there, and that's, you know, I think we've gotten away from that. If we do sit and watch nature, maybe we might learn a lesson or two <laughs> On the same note that you were talking about, Mary, that I found really interesting and it was kind of new to me was the relationship, the plant to plant relationship, mm -hmm. which I never realized. Like, and you could talk about it a little more. For the, you mean like for the yucca? Not, no, for like when I was doing my class, like a lot of the plants, I don't remember if it was the bee balm, like will tend to grow underneath another tree, and if that tree's not there, that plant. Well, that's true, and that we have there. There is that succession of plants that happens in nature. That if we pay attention to it, makes us better gardeners. Knowing that um, the aspen trees need 
a big area wide open with sunshine to grow. And then there's certain plants that come up under them, including the conifers, like the spruce and the fir. They need shade for them to then grow up, and then those aspen will die out and all of that understory will come up, like the currants mm -hmm. and the um, sumacs, things, paying attention to how much direct sunlight things require and how much um, shade they require. Well, plant yields like strawberries and pine trees. Um, they communicate with each other through through here the mycorrhiza, and they share the sugars with the pine trees and the, the, uh, the sugars from the pine trees, and they they provide through the mycorrhiza uh, uh, minerals and stuff to the pines, and you get really flavor flavorful strawberries from other yeah. trees. Yeah, and there are so many. We're learning so much more about that now about mycorrhizal soil and fungus that these plants have these interrelated. Um, uh, relationships underground, we can't see them. It's kind of, you know, um, a scandalous thing. But, <laughs> but we're learning more about this, and it's fascinating for people who, you know, well, are microscopically we can see it. Yes, microscopically we're seeing it. People are studying it, paying more attention to it. But then we we get into areas where um, there's not enough money for people to do this kind of research, and it is important. You know, and I think that. Um, to the work of and speaking to ha and having adequate resources to, to document that, um, which is basically science-based, but also to understand that the indigenous people were also doing this and where they documented this. You'll find this information on the walls of the canyon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest things I, when I first started doing a bunch of research for this garden was I had read some materials that had all already been published, documented, um, and youths had been um, uh, interviewed and things had been written down. They actually were and are some of the most sophisticated naturalists because they know when to use things, when not to use things, which part of the plant to use, what time of year to use it. It's really fascinating. And these things, like you said, are documented on the walls of the canyons and passed down through that technical ecological knowledge. <clears throat> Um, just kind of going off of what you're both saying, um, I heard you say um, earlier, Regina, that like one of the big challenges that we kind of face with the challenges that are coming in terms of climate or whatever it is, is that we we know a lot, but a lot of our knowledge is siloed, and that we have a need to have these conversations that are amidst those silos. So I'm just curious um, if anyone in the audience or both of you might have. Um, you, you know, what you think is important to be able to make those space for those conversations. Like, what can everybody be doing to make sure our knowledge isn't getting siloed? It's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> if any of you have a rich uncle who just wants to donate yeah. <laughs> space and resources, we can set up some venues. <laughs> Well, I'll just add that I know that I've been working with Wayfinder a little more than I can think of, and they, we are going to form a partnership hopefully and start doing one of those articles. Um, and I think the same should be done with um, the newspaper too. Yeah, I think and education yeah. is critical, public education, not just education in the schools or in an um, mm -hmm. educational setting, but common education information in public spaces available to people. Because we've lost a lot of um, traditional knowledge that my grandmother had just in gardening or, you know, uh, I, it's so important to bring back some of those um, old methods of doing things. And making it accessible. And yeah. making it accessible. Mm -hmm. There was a question back here and then CJ has a question and you have a question. Yeah, I, I was curious, like, what can we learn about how to adapt to drought from a growing perspective? I mean, the, the garden was really very deliberate, you know, when you're putting everything together. So I'm just curious from a more natural perspective, if you weren't being as deliberate, how can you how can you learn how to adapt to the different seasons in a more natural way? I guess mostly by for native plants, for example, um, noticing when they bloom, when they produce fruit, and what plants are around them. 
Um, so you wouldn't want to plant, like, and, and you already know this, you don't want to plant something that needs a lot of water with something that need, doesn't need very much water. Or you don't want to um, shade something that needs to have a lot of light. I think it's just more of being observant on what the needs of specific plants are and noticing in nature how they, um, you know, what, what, they're, what they're doing naturally in the environment. I, I think know. recognizing a little bit of your your space, um, where where you're going to have recognizing the plants that need more water, maybe you need to place them closer to a source of water versus um, other places that you may notice are drier. You want to probably plant the type of vegetation that is a little more resilient to the drier spaces. And I know that even in your yards, because I've seen this in my parents' yard, which they grow everything. In, anything that you could possibly grow. We've seen a change in even just the yard environment of where certain areas are more dry, where they weren't before. And so just having to shift things a little bit according to how, and seeing how your water flows. And paying attention to the water table is an excellent way. And then determining where that water source is versus trying to, and I say this, the whole damming and creating mm -hmm. reservoirs and diverting water it doesn't quite work. So we shouldn't try it on a smaller scale. We should probably work with how things are in that natural environment instead of perfecting something that's already been perfect. Right. Mm -hmm. Looking at nature. CJ first. And well, what I was just going to share, because it's more into our education, I just want to point out, UTE, -U Understanding Through Education. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, how does knowledge sharing occur between tribes and do you find that like other tribes in this area have had similar land stewardship practices or does it differ a lot? Knowledge sharing is still a challenge <laughs> between tribes. And I think um, it's not as, I should say, we're not in such a difficult place that we were maybe 20, 25 years ago. We're beginning to realize what common areas would serve in sharing. Um, and of course, there's going to be certain things that we're just not going to want to even share with other tribes, you know? Um, and, and, you know, a lot of the, the restoration projects, a lot of the cultural awareness and education through some of this stuff, that is becoming more necessary. And we recognize that even amongst other tribes. And so we're, we're, we're apt to, to be more cooperative. Um, and I think that even learning how to share resources to better meet some of those challenges has been something we've created partnerships. Also recognizing um, other nonprofits, NGOs that might be doing this, creating partnerships even outside the reservations and communities to be able to share that information um, to meet those together. I think we're recognizing we're not gonna get through this challenging time alone, <laughs> but everything is going to have to be together. Yes. Um, do y'all have any recommendations for how the grandchildren of immigrants, like most of us are, can support the land stewardship that indigenous communities are doing without like taking over like we always do? <laughs> That's, a great, That's a great question. You mean acting like an invasive place? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I think first and foremost, and I think he did a great job in, in giving that invasive plant 
its time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and, and understanding that, you know, I think finding those common threads is going to be important. Sharing those common values. Um, but also being very clear that you're not there to um, solve the problem. Um, just because I, I, this is me, I'm going to go to being a former um, elected leader for my tribe. You don't know how many times organizations come with that first and foremost on their mind that I can do this for you and we can do it so well and we can do it tomorrow. And then our next question is, okay, how much of my land do you work, are you looking at and how much is it going to cost me? And that's coming with that weird little extractive view on it, but also not understanding that um, you are not gonna save me from myself. And that's how a lot of organizations approach this. I think you really have to think about yourself as a partner, as um, another human being, and getting to know, tell me your story about your, how your grandparents got here. And then let me tell you how my grandparents have existed here. To be able to share those spaces and those stories um, on a very human basis is really going to get you where we need to be. Because at this point in our time and existence, I don't care where you came from, that isn't going to stop this drought. <laughs> it's still going to happen. But what we need to acknowledge is how are we going to get through this together? Understanding how we all got here and creating that, that same space and time is probably the only way that we will learn to deal with one another, whether you're an immigrant or indigenous to the land. You are indigenous to a piece of this land in this on this planet. And that's the one thing that again, it's about how people have siloed themselves and you are an immigrant versus a natural native somewhere you're indigenous so understand that value that um, but how you got here from wherever that may be maybe your story help me understand that and let me help you understand do you have ceremonies or outreaches or celebrations that um, that exist to try and educate us immigrants <laughs> You know, we do have ceremonies, but some of the ceremonies that we have are um, pretty closed off. Um, but there are celebrations, like we, um, in the spring, it's really important to the you people, and that's the bear dance. And you all are invited. You all are invited to participate. You're all invited to witness. Um, be there during the feast, eat with us. That's a time that we come together and we celebrate a new season, a new year, the new plants, um, just reconnecting with, with people and, and places is really the whole gist of that. That's our new year. That's when our new cycle starts. And I think you can, um, you can subscribe to newsletters that'll tell you when these things kind of happen. Like I think the Southern Butte Indian Reservation has, they have a great website and you can go and look and see what's happening, that public events are, um, what they're happening and when they're happening plan to go and visit yeah or the they provide um, travel newspapers you can see what's going on and see what celebrations um, they host like um, more of an um, an inner tribal which brings together all types of of the different tribes together um, to the powwows and stuff like that that's something that you all are welcome to, to attend and, and see um, the dancers connect with the drum beat and enjoy themselves and yeah. Is there anything we should do to contribute? Be mindful, be present, go. <laughs> <laughs> I come from, I, my father was a, was a research biologist and he had relationships with both the Navajo and the Hopi. And I know that amongst the, the Navajo, when you come to visit, it's good to bring something with you you know, flour, candy, something to contribute to it instead of being a parasite. <laughs> yeah, 
Um, and it all depends on, on you, if, if you, whatever you feel. Um, a lot of times, you know, um, the meal aspect that, of that is usually the most important of any celebration or ceremony. Um, you know, feeding is always um, a huge honor, but it's also a huge task. Um, <laughs> and, and we just don't feed in small, I mean, we feed. So, um, as you probably have experienced with what they do it in the Hopi community, so, um, just, you know, a lot of people bring like a bag of flour, you know, to help to, to go towards the mill. Um, and that's huge because I think even now, especially after pandemic, where a lot of resources were expended, we don't quite live the same way with the same resources. Um, and something we are experiencing is we also don't do things the same way that we did before. Um, I've been to several um, celebrations and I just, I'm like, wow, it, it not only feels good to finally be together, but how much has changed, even with how we deal with one another and how we're around each other. But, you know, seeing the resources and how we put together those meal times and, and putting things together like that, everything is a little bit different. So I, I recognize that. Any other questions? Okay. It's been delightful to have you all here. I hope that you'll come back on a good day when it's not driven by the weather and spend time out in the garden. We're gonna have a community um, weeding event um, later this month and next month it'll be a little more um, kept. Not totally kept because it's a native garden but we're gonna get some of those weeds out of there and, and make it a little more inviting to be here. How often do these occur? The weed events, weeding events, no, or the, this kind of event? This, kind. this is the first, oh, we'll let Audrey speak to that. Yeah, well, this is, um, like I said, this is the first time we are doing this class through that Beginning Farmer Rancher program with Valley Food Partnership. But it sounds like we may be able to do future ones. So I actually, um, I have an evaluation form, and in that I've included um, you, a space for you to sign up in case you'd like us to keep you informed on future events like this. Um, if we're able to get them scheduled in the next couple of months. Um, so I can, once we wrap up here, there's a QR code that everybody can scan and you can leave your email um, if you're interested in hearing about when the next one 